Hi, and uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Jonathan Selig. I am the executive chairman and co-founder of Ridge, and I'm here with Nir Sheffi, who is also a co-founder of Ridge, as well as the co-CEO and CTO of the company. And today, we'd like to spend some time talking to you a little bit about the distributed cloud paradigm, which is an alternative to the centralized cloud model that most of us are familiar with. Um, and we also want to talk about how managed Kubernetes powers this model of a decentralized uh, distributed cloud and makes it possible to deploy and scale cloud native applications virtually anywhere in the world without some of the latency and data residency challenges that we currently see when we look at the large public clouds. So let's dive into this and talk a little bit about what this new uh, paradigm looks like and, and how it works. Great, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, as you know, uh, most uh, public cloud services today are uh, provided through centralized cloud platforms, such as the big hyperscalers. And clearly, uh, uh, these work amazingly well, and uh, they provide many uh, services that I'm sure many of you are using today. But, uh, but we're seeing that sometimes the centralized uh, public clouds leave what we call coverage gaps. In other words, it can't uh, provide the level of service that you need. For, for example, if you need uh, your workloads to run in a close proximity to your customers and the public cloud is not there, that's a physical coverage gap. More and more applications and use cases need to be close in close proximity to end customers and offer good performance. As time, as time goes on, uh, and we will uh, uh, new uh, communication technologies such as such as uh, 5G. Uh, we're seeing more and more demand for high throughput and low latency. Uh, there are also data related coverage gaps. Another reason why centralized cloud is sometimes not a good fit for applications owners. Due to, to data regulation and data sovereignty issues, you may need to save data in country. In many situations, public cloud uh, is not good enough. Uh, lastly, uh, there are com commercial coverage gaps, for example, architectural decisions uh, that you already uh, been taking or existing relationship with local data centers. So for all of those reasons, the centralized cloud may not be uh, sufficient to satisfy all the cloud needs of many application owners. So Neil, that's a, I think a pretty good summary of what we've been talking about a lot inside of the company at Ridge. And it's all points to this need to rethink the paradigm and, and sort of ask this question of, hey, why does a cloud need to be centralized? The world is really big and the demand is huge from all sorts of different geographies. And so, you know, how is it reasonable to think that the hyperscalers are gonna be the complete answer for every single application owner's cloud needs in terms of coverage, geography, network. And, and although the large clouds have amazing economies of scale and amazing capabilities, the locality and the, the distribution in many, many cases, uh, it can offer benefits which maybe outweigh the uh, size and scale of the hyperscale clouds. And so the benefit of being distributed can be very, very significant depending on the application type and the application requirement. The ability to deploy and to scale where you need to be, even the ability to add a pop if one isn't available in a particular geography that you want to run in, which is something we've seen from, from some of our customers at Ridge, um, can be a really big deal. And of course, the distributed you know, paradigm of, of infrastructure is also very, very relevant to both hybrid cloud and multi-cloud models, both things that are very much sort of in, in active conversation with a lot of enterprises and a lot of companies out there. It's become a fundamental part of, of any company's hybrid or multi-cloud architecture to understand that they're going to need some uh, you know, effectively sort of distributed uh, cloud capability. Uh, you know, Jonathan, now that we've uh, uh, discussed the public cloud coverage gap challenge and uh, we've raising the idea of a non-centralized cloud or what we call a distributed cloud, let's discuss how it's done. 
our vision when we founded our company was that uh, we wanted to run our cloud in, on any underlying infrastructure or any heterogeneous physical servers on any underlying IaaS or physical or virtualization systems or bare metal machines. So we could achieve a cloud that uh, hypothetically could be expanded to hundreds and thousands of locations or regions, again, lack of, of a better word, uh, and which we could offer fast integration and capacity all over the world. Uh, to users, it would feel exactly like a public cloud that they're used and familiar with. Uh, for this to work, we've built a platform based upon cloud native building blocks. The first of these, these are a fully managed Kubernetes solution, which enables users to run whatever they would like uh, to run, uh, since it's based on a de facto spec of deployment on a cloud, that's Kubernetes. Any application on AWS, GCP or Azure running on EKS, GKE or AKS can run on Ridge without needing to change a single line of code except that, it, that with Ridge, it can run on hundreds and thousands of locations. The second building block is our container service, which allows users to deploy containers. Um, if you don't wanna have the you know, full, full blown Kubernetes, or uh, sometimes you don't need that, then you could just say, I want this image and run it in thousands and hundreds and thousands of locations. And we take care of all of the heavy lifting of the physical infrastructure. And the last building block that we've deployed is our fully object storage, uh, fully compatible S3 API object storage solution uh, the, that has, again, fully compatible. In this case, the de facto spec is uh, uh, S3, uh, but the difference is that it could run globally in hundreds and thousands of locations across the Ridge uh, network. All this uh, works on top of any underlying physics. Ridge doesn't own anything. We use an amazing data centers and telcos that are already out there. Uh, that's why we can scale end endless public or private regions. Uh, but most importantly, beyond all of those capabilities, Ridge is a cloud you engage as you would do in any modern public cloud through a simple online interface. As a customer, you just need your credit card, pay as you go. You don't need any prior commercial agreements with any of our data centers around the world. Ridge distributed cloud enables developers to, to describe the required resources as they deploy their Kubernetes clusters, container or object storage. And as a managed Kubernetes service, the distributed platform we adjust workloads automatically by spinning up computing instances wherever they're needed. I will soon show you a demo of how it works. So Nir, before we get into the demo, I think one of the things to talk about here is that the, the flexibility and the functionality that you've described is becoming more and more essential with the increase in uh, cloud native activity and cloud native application development. Um, and to be able to do this anywhere that, that it's needed. The big promise in cloud computing was always the abstraction of infrastructure complexities, meaning that developers were gonna be freed up to focus on writing great code. But you know, I know that in a lot of conversations that we've had with folks, we find that uh, you know, today's advanced uh, containerized microservices based and cloud native applications are often so complex that developers are finding themselves spending actually a lot more time dealing with infrastructure configuration and design than uh, you know sometimes even than than with coding. So it's kind of not what the promise was mm -hmm. was going to be here. You know, very true. As a de facto standard for container orchestration, Kubernetes plays a role as an enabler of cloud native application deployments, offering a huge flexibility in moving workloads between environments. However, the full potential of many cloud native application often with strict latency and throughput requirements cannot be realized until they can be deployed anywhere to ensure superior performance. And we're seeing applications today that need that performance. For example, we have a customer offering a remote desktop and a VDI and they need extremely low latency. Uh, these are all, uh, um, there are, all, there are 
uh, also many apps uh, that are uh, emerging, like uh, connected vehicles and all kinds of AR, VR applications, which uh, proximity is essential. And of course, the future. Who knows what apps would look like in five years? But I'll bet they'll be uh, very dependent on low latency. I think that's for sure. We keep seeing more and more as we engage with customers that more and, and, and more applications are being developed that become latency sensitive and they care a lot about that. Um, before Nir starts a demo of how uh, managed Kubernetes is used in the distributed architecture that we're describing here, I wanna discuss just a couple of our current deployments um, with customers who are running applications on Ridge uh, and these are applications that really were made possible because of Ridge's distributed cloud paradigm. Um, so the, the first one that I'll describe is a provider of browser isolation. Your chat mentioned this just a, a minute ago, browser isolation um, uh, and cybersecurity solutions for that. The solution is basically the idea of replicating desktops to make sure that they are malware free. And as you can imagine, end users who are using these remote desktops can't sense any uh, delay or lag in their browser and, and feel like this experience is a, you know, is a simulated desktop experience. The company that we were working with on, on this deployment has told us that when they had a set of users in Paris connecting to a hyperscale data center in Frankfurt, the latency level in that uh, communication path was simply unacceptable. People using that uh, uh, virtual desktop offering felt like there was lag. Um, and so the ability to find a distributed solution that gives them a point of presence right close to those Parisian users was critical for the, the functionality and the customer satisfaction of their offering. Um, uh, another deployment I can describe, which is a pretty interesting one, is we have customers created an eyewear simulation uh, software that enables you to try on glasses virtually through an, an app. It's a, a, a large uh, omni-channel eyewear retailer and, and um, users love this functionality, but this functionality depends on having uh, GPU in proximity to that, that end user. All of this is being dealt with, uh, with Kubernetes as the, the management platform for these workloads and the customer's workloads are running on local data centers uh, in lots of different places. Moving this capability to a public cloud really wasn't an, an option that was going to be effective for this company. It would have added a lot of latency, it would have degraded the app experience. And so they came to us because they knew that we had the ability to easily give them these cloud native services with GPU on the back end in lots of uh, localities where they needed that, that capability. So those are just a couple of examples of places that we've um, found this, this real embracing of, and in fact, this requirement for a highly distributed cloud in order to, to make these, these specific applications that customers have come to us with uh, work. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, now I think it's a, it's a good time for us to begin a demo of how the platform works. Good. Uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and Nir will bring up your, um, uh, your desktop and let you take uh, folks on a tour of how the Ridge Cloud uh, operates. Cool. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so that's Ridge. That's the UI. And obviously, there's an API. Uh, you're welcome to go ahead to uh, our uh, website. There's a link to our developer portal. You'll be able to see all of it is a fully RESTful API. So you could download uh, our open API spec and you could try it out. Uh, and th this is the UI of the end user, uh, developer, uh, DevOps, uh, IT, and whatnot, uh, that you could interact with our cloud. So once you log in, and we are connected to any uh, external identity providers, uh, such as uh, Google or um, GitHub and Microsoft, um, or external OAuth services, uh, you are in a context of an organization and a project here. So we uh, are handling uh, different, you know, all of our identity and management system uh, could, you could manage uh, members, give them permissions and so on, very similar to what you might find uh, on, a, on a public cloud. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here in, in this demo, uh, but uh, bear in mind that we do uh, provide that out of the box. What you see here, those are data centers. 
Uh, we are connected currently to hundreds uh, of data centers uh, in production. Uh, we could connect to more and more locations as, as time go and as customer demands. Uh, we can connect uh, to public data centers, uh, similar to what you might uh, call uh, or use as zones or uh, regions. Uh, and you could see here that we show uh, those public data centers uh, that REACH has integrated and has commercial agreements with uh, to, uh, to, to, you, to you guys, to, you, to the users, to the end users. As you could see here, we don't hide the fact that it's, it is operated by a specific data center provider. For example, this is operated by a catalyst from uh, New Zealand, and you could see everything in a transparent way like certifications, hardware requirements, obviously the location uh, and uh, pricing here. So you can see pricing here, for lack of a better word, this is, um, those are uh, the instance types. Uh, but as you might imagine, each data center, each location has their own heterogeneous underlying physics, heterogeneous underlying uh, infrastructure. So we transparently show it to you. So you could see here different providers, uh, everything is in a transparent way. So you could choose the best location, best certification, best SLA, and obviously best price. So for example, if you could see here, this is one of our partners in, in uh, Hong Kong, and you could see here that uh, the instance price is a little bit different because they offer an ability to have flexible uh, resources. Uh, so you could do some uh, cool stuff, uh, not just use specific instance types. Uh, and obviously pricing is a little bit different because it's priced by a CPU memory or storage here. And you could see and get all information out of here using our uh, UI or API. So uh, those would be uh, public data centers that we manage. As you might imagine, we are also able to connect uh, to uh, on-premise or private uh, data centers. So if you, as a customer, um, have some uh, internal uh, data center private installation in, a, in your own data center or in uh, on top of one of the data center that exists out there, we can connect uh, to that and uh, connect to any underlying IaaS technologies uh, based on VMware, or OpenStack, uh, or whatnot. You know all of the different kinds of flavors and versions, and it becomes a pop in our system or a region in our system. Uh, obviously, fully private to your uh, organization, so nobody else. Uh, it's a fully multi-tenant uh, system, so nobody else who is able to. Uh, connect to that, and you could deploy anything that you could deploy in the public regions uh, using Ridge. So those are public data centers. We also offer um, an on-premise uh, solution that we can connect to. Um, so uh, th that's uh, the data centers. On top of all of those data centers, we have uh, developed uh, web services. And uh, so we take legacy infrastructure, like basic IaaS solution, and turn it into a fully uh, cloud native web services. And our flagship, as I could show you right now, is um, uh, our fully managed Kubernetes uh, solution. We offer uh, a fully managed Kubernetes solution, same features, same capabilities as you might find on AWS GCP and Azure, EKS, GKE, or AKS. The only difference is that our solution can run in hundreds and thousands of locations across all of the data centers that we are integrated to. Uh, we uh, made a lot of effort to, as you will be able to see, in uh, making this a very, very simple experience to onboard. Uh, so you will be able to uh, hopefully uh, see that we could, for example, spin up uh, clusters in a few minutes, like three to four minutes. Uh, we could manage them and we, uh, we manage the cluster end-to-end um, -end by uh, auto-provisioning, uh, auto-scaling, auto-healing, auto-upgrades. And obviously we manage all of the underlying physics like load balancing, persistent volume, and so on. Uh, so let me show you how easy it is uh, to create a Kubernetes cluster in in, a, in one of the ridge uh, points of presence uh, around the world. Uh, and again, this could be in hundreds and thousands of locations. So let's call this uh, cluster a demo. Uh, we support a high available and low available control plane. And that means uh, the amount of master nodes. Obviously, if you don't need to be high available, like for uh, you know, development or QA, 
you can uncheck this and we only create one master. Uh, we support Kubernetes versions uh, um, as a part of CNCF. We are a member of CNCF and we comply to all uh, CNCF uh, conformity testing. Uh, that means that we are fully uh, Kubernetes distribution and fully um, have full certificates for hosted providers in the same way that AWS GCP or Azure has. So if something runs on Kubernetes, it can run on Ridge uh, seamlessly. You don't need to change one line of code. Now we could choose the location. So let's uh, choose a, a location. I don't know, let's choose something, for example, in Paris here. So as you could see, this is one of our partners, Orange in, in Europe. Uh, so I could choose this one. Uh, and if I choose a node pool, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the terms, node pool is a group of worker nodes. Worker nodes, those are machines who actually do the work. Uh, so I could give it a name. Um, we support fully auto-scaling capabilities. That means that we could say, I want a minimum of uh, two, uh, mass, two um, worker nodes in this uh, node pool and a maximum of maybe three nodes. And we automatically scale it up uh, in case Kubernetes cannot allocate a pod uh, and, uh, since there's lack of resources. So we choose a node and we scale it up automatically. Uh, so in this demo, I'm not gonna auto scale anything. Um, and then as you could see, I chose a location in Paris and you'll be able to see that all of the resources were propagated here according to the location. So for example, here, this is the instance types or the ability to run and uh, in this specific location. If I choose, uh, for example, another location, let's say I choose uh, the one in Bangalore here, you'll see it's a little bit different because this one offers more flexibility to the instance types. Let's go back to our uh, data center in Orange here. And let's choose like a small machine with two CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM. As you could see here, there's an uh, estimation of cost. Uh, you could add labels and things to this uh, node, uh, node pool and add more node pools in different sizing, different capabilities. But basically, that's it. Once I press create, um, you could sit back, relax. It takes about three to four minutes. So we're pretty fast in um, uh, auto provisioning the cluster. And we create a fully isolated cluster here, uh, similar to a VPC. Create an isolated VLAN. We create uh, we create the machines. The machine uh, each machine we install operating system on the machine. As you can see here, it's uh, already uh, allocated a NAT uh, gateway IP for the for the VPC. Uh, so um, we install Kubernetes certification security. We configure all of the underlying physics, so you guys don't need to. Uh, we configure load balancing and persistent volumes of everything. Uh, so once the cluster uh, switches into, from a creating into a running state, that means that all worker nodes has been provisioned correctly and, um, and uh, all uh, worker nodes and uh, sorry, worker nodes and master nodes are in a ready state so they could accept uh, incoming traffic, uh, sorry, deployments uh, on the, uh, and start deploying a, an application. Uh, so that's auto provisioning. As you could see here, uh, this is a run in Paris right now on top of one of our partners, Orange. It's a high available, meaning three master nodes. You could see here at the node pools, you could see there are two uh, worker nodes uh, being created right now. So that's auto provisioning. Uh, we support auto scaling for each and every one of the node pools. And we also monitor the integrity of the cluster 24 seven. That means if one of the nodes fail, for whatever reason, we know how to auto heal it. Uh, so we know how to gracefully kill uh, the unhealthy node, create another one instead until it joined the cluster. So you guys don't need to wake up at 2 a.m. in order to fix the cluster. Uh, so, and everything is done seamlessly uh, to, uh, to the end uh, customer. Uh, so uh, we showed auto uh, provisioning, uh, auto scaling, auto healing, uh, we also uh, have auto upgrades. So between Kubernetes versions, in a click of a button, uh, you could go ahead and uh, upgrade. Uh, once it is uh, upgradable, it will appear here on, in this menu and you could click it and it will uh, be upgraded. And we do uh, intend to release uh, version 22 and 23 in the next uh, weeks. We also take care of all of the underlying physics. That means that we know how to configure everything uh, in, from load balancer to persistent volumes. Uh, so 
you guys don't need to. The only thing that you as a user need to do is deploy your app. Uh, what I'm about to show you right now is once this uh, switches into, uh, into a running state, hopefully soon, uh, if the gods of the demo like me, uh, I will uh, create an access uh, key, an access configuration file to it, and we'll deploy an application. Uh, we'll deploy uh, something simple from uh, using standard Kubernetes tools, uh, such as Helm, uh, to deploy from Helm repository from Bitnami. Uh, I'm going to deploy uh, WordPress, which is a website uh, from Bitnami. Uh, the website utilizes or uses or deploys uh, WordPress application, that's a container. Uh, it will deploy also um, MariaDB, which is a MySQL database, and it will require a load balancer uh, because we want to have our uh, customers uh, have ingress uh, uh, traffic uh, internally to the cluster. Um, and uh, we'll use also persistent volumes. So you'll see that disks will be needed to be created. Yay, cluster is running. Took about four less than four minutes. So um, you'll see that we, we will uh, want to run um, uh, also persistent volumes. So you'll see uh, what I'm about to show you like uh, shows you how we can configure everything seamlessly. So all of the resources, all of the physical resources, so you guys don't need to. Uh, let me uh, just uh, create a, an access uh, token here. Uh, this is like, uh, giving permissions to one of the members of my organization. And in this use case, uh, that's me. Here, I'm gonna uh, grant myself, let's call this a demo. Uh, and I could associate this with an RBAC uh, group internally to the cluster. And I can create this. As you could see, this is, creates a standard uh, Kubernetes configuration file, which I could download to my machine here, which I did. If I switch to my command line tool and I could uh, ex uh, export uh, and do cube config, uh, and go to my downloads, and that's my demo. I hope it's this one. Uh, so, sorry, and do get notes. If everything works fine, you will see that we have three masternodes um, in Paris right now and two Walker nodes as, expect, as uh, we expected. Let's deploy our WordPress. Uh, this is done from Bitnami um, uh, stable repository, Helm repository. For those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, this is similar to an app store. Uh, so people could uh, use a lot of charts over there, which are basically the apps that could, could be deployed on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so let me clear this and let's see what we have deployed. If we're looking at uh, pods right now, you'll see there are two pods running right now, WordPress and MySQL. Uh, and uh, let's look at uh, services. And you'll see that there is a load balancer of a, of, or there's a service of a type load balancer that requires ingress traffic in. If we switch to our UI, you will see the cluster is uh, switched into a configuring state uh, pretty fast. So uh, we missed it, but it's uh, switched into a running state. But you'll see that there's a load balancer here was created for us. So as you could see, we take care of all of the underlying configuration. So we automatically knew that there's a load balancer a requirement uh, from the application that requires those protocols and ports. We also support firewall configuration, health checks, as you could see here, and those are the health checks on the nodes for each port. And uh, we also take care of the public IP. So you could see in this use case, we uh, allocated a public IP. Hopefully if we do this again, this public IP is propagated here internally and wired up into Kubernetes. Uh, if we look at uh, persistent volumes, you could see that we have requested two disks, eight gigabytes, and that should be connected to MariaDB, that's the database, and 10 gigabytes connected to WordPress. Persistent disks or persistent volumes allow the user, if the node goes down or the pod goes down, no worries, uh, data is still, uh, is still, uh, still persists. So Kubernetes can allocate the new pod on another node and uh, uh, the system could function with no data loss and minimum downtime. If we go to our, uh, and by the way, before I do that, if 
we look at our pods um, and we have some more information, you'll see that Kubernetes has decided to allocate WordPress on, an, on this node and MariaDB, the database, on a different node. And as you could see here, if we're gonna to go to persistent volumes, our system knows uh, that this uh, was required uh, by Kubernetes and knows how to create those disks, attach those disks into the specific nodes here, as you could see, different nodes, and wire it up internally in Kubernetes. In case uh, a node goes down or a pod goes down and Kubernetes allocates it, we know how to detach it, attach it again. So you guys as application developers don't need to do anything other than uh, deploy as I showed you here, uh, your application. Let's, let's see if uh, our uh, application runs and as you could see it is. Let's copy the, uh, the IP here. And if we go uh, here and browse, uh, we should get our website, yay. Uh, so under five minutes, we've, we created a fully running managed Kubernetes solution, very similar to what you might find on the hyperscalers in a very, very simple way, but we could do it in hundreds and thousands of locations across the region network. So that's the, that concludes uh, the first part of, uh, of uh, Kubernetes. On that note, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining this uh, webinar. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, contact us at any time. Uh, we'd love to open up a trial account for you guys and so you could play around. If there's a specific use case or specific question, uh, feel free and don't hesitate to um, let us know. Uh, I do appreciate uh, you joining this webinar. Uh, thank you very much.